Iron oxoxides enhance the creation of sulfuric acid particles in the atmosphere. Now, how does this work out? Well, apparently, let me read this for you. The main nucleating vapor in the atmosphere is actually thought to be sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4. Uh, basically, hydrogen to hydrogens, one sulfur, and four oxygen. And it's stabilized by a compound called ammonia, which is nitrogen and three hydrogens, NH3. However, in like marine and polar regions, like, you know, the places above the uh, triangle, or in a trench, and the North Pole, and the South Pole, and the Arctic, and the Antarctic, and I, apparently these, any three ones, nucleated vapors in the atmosphere, is actually pretty low, and sulfuric acid goes ahead, and is frequently found with other iron oxides. Now, for years, people have actually been looking at this, and like, thought that iron, iodine oxides are like, eh, you know what, I, I mean, th this thing is too low in quantity in the other types of world, and those kind of things, and iodine acids too. But then, experiments that happen in the CERN, cloud cosmics leaving outdoor droplets chamber, they actually displayed the interplay of these H2SO4 and HIOXs, which is like HI, like hydrogens and iodine oxygens, and like several of those during atmospheric particle nucleation, which is basically like how they interact with each other. Fancy name for that. And they found that HOX actually greatly embraces the sulfur with and the and the uh, ammonia nucleation through two different interactions where like the HIO3 bonds with the H2SO4 and strongly bound like basically an ion an ion compound, an ion compound, like ionic compounds, where the positive and the negative charges of atoms, in this case molecules, are like connected together, and the acid-base pairs and molecular clusters. Like global observations imply that this HIOX is enhancing the uh, sulfuric acid nucleation rates 10 to 10 to 4, 10 to 10 fold in marine and polar region. Dumb it down, I'll just say that we're seeing one well, nucleating vapor. vapor <coughs> Bless you. And it's thought that sulfuric acid is stabilized by a compound called ammonia. However, ammonia is not in some places, which are pretty important, like the Arctic and the Antarctic, and some marine areas like the Pacific Ocean and Antarctic Ocean and so on. So they, they, step, they found out that iodine is commonly exposed with these. And so they're like, yeah, let's just do a study about this. And they realized iodine has also a very important role in doing the... the uh, nucleation of sulfuric acid particles in the atmosphere too and that's about it yeah on to the next one light gated channel row those big charged proton induced calcium release in guard cells plant optogenetics now this is basically something pretty important here because it's about plants and you can literally modify them to get what you want now there has been a long standing recognition that stimuli induce cytosulfic pH alterations actually coincide in calcium ion levels, basically meaning that the pH of whatever liquid you put in can coincide with like calcium, calcium ions and how much of that was in plants and that interdependence between the protons and of like hydrogens and calcium ions actually remain poorly understood and then these researchers, there are only one, two, three, four, five, five of them, address this topic using the light gated channel rhodospic HCKCR2 from a type of plant called Hyphocytrion catenoides, which actually operates with an ion of hydrogen as a conductive and calcium as an imperable ion channel. Now, basically, plants work like they exchange ATP, and they also use that to go ahead and use the currency to live and to get themselves in. And the signal results in a membrane depolarization through the activation of these calcium ions, dependent on this, like, some anion channels, which actually enable them to be able to control the stomatal movement, basically the holes that let in the water and air and those kind of things. Basically, if I'm gonna uh, try to explain this in more simple words, you, there are calcium and hydrogen ions that guard cells and plants use, and those uh, ions are in controlled, and they use light gated channel rhodospic sparks, basically just sparks, to go basically go ahead and monitor these proton induced calcium, and they release them in the guard cells, which are the ones that open and close the hole so that of a plant leaves so that they can let out a lot of uh, oxygen and keep 
carbon dioxide in and water out, but they can't always keep carbon dioxide in anyway. And they use this to, well, spark proton-induced calcium to be released in the guard cell. They'll be releasing calcium more. And that's about it. Next up. Oh yeah, and here's some grass. They expose them, expose some light to this, and so that it ended up going like this for a few seconds. And then they even affected the pH. They even changed the pH a little too, so that they can see its affection. Like those red areas or some serious areas. Like look, pH 7, basically the pH water, the neutral pH. pH 6, a little bit acidic. pH 5, not more acidic than pH 6, but not that acidic. And yeah, here we go. And it's like the affection of how it seems to work. And this is from 0 seconds to 100 seconds. And I don't think I should, I, I can show more. So next one. Well, now we don't really have much science. Let's go ahead and start talking about a working life. A challenging move. Now, this is by an author called Adrian Beckert, and he is now a Caltech, and he works there too. Now, this guy is a postdoc, well, at least he was. He's still a postdoc still, at least at the time of this writing. And he's done his PhD in his home country of Switzerland. And then he decided, he told his wife that he wanted to go ahead and have an academic career. Are they gonna need to go abroad? And then he's all like, okay, you know what? We're gonna go abroad, honey. And, he's, and she's all like, whatever. And they actually expected a big change, sure, but I did not expect a seismic change. This seismic change had to be from their arrival. They had new accommodations and things, and basically they were stressed out a lot. And fortunately for this guy, Adrian himself, he was had a lot of stress. And this stress bled into his work life, which found out he couldn't have the number of hours he wanted to, and found out that this was a problem because the new learning measurement techniques for his postdoc had built, and he built an incremental setup. And he also spent a significant time amount of work working on his PhD, unfinished projects from his PhD. And of course, that ended up with him having a lot of stress. And then he had to go ahead with an advisor, and he couldn't really tell his friend that he had a positive day, because, well, yeah. And he went to his advisor, an advisor, a counselor, and the advice that, <laughs> this is going to be a little weird, the advice that the counselor gave Adrian was this, a little bit joking too, be more like Trump, be more like Trump, basically Trump tried to blame everyone else and tried to shift the blame from, t from him to someone else, and with that, he basically said, try to put the blame away from yourself and try to be more like Trump because he was blaming himself a bit too much, and so he tried to do that, and it kind of worked greatly. And he also, the council also encouraged Adrian to share his struggles with his supervisor. And then he did, and that worked out so well. It worked out so well, and he started carrying, he started trying to blame less, less of himself. Also, he did start blaming more of other people too, eh. But then he was starting to juggle work and home, and he's getting better now. He's in a better place now, and he is now changing and continuing to push forward in his career. And yes, he is still a postdoc. That's it. So that's all science. We'll see you guys soon. Down now. Peace. And have a lovely day, people. Have a lovely day, week, whatever you're gonna do, wherever you are, whenever you're watching it. Bye.